cover today. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Debbie Martin. I'm your current treasurer uh, here at the association. And I'm here today um, to welcome all of you to the Bank of King Cod's Flood Seminar. Obviously, this is a topic that's terribly important to all of us. It couldn't be more relevant or more time sensitive. We're very lucky that uh, the Bank of Cape Cod was willing to put this on today and serve you all lunch. I think that deserves a round of applause. Um, your host today is Dante DeMassa. Dante is the Vice President of Residential Lending at the Bank of Cape Cod. He has over 25 years of experience in residential lending. And most importantly, Dante has a home on Mount Vinda that's going to be in the new flood zone. <laughs> so please help me welcome Dante DeMassi from the Bank of Cape Cod. Thank you, everybody. Good afternoon. The Bigger Waters um, ins Flood Insurance Reform Act uh, is upon us, and it is going to have an effect on the market. And I think being out with talking to a lot of you, um, the impact I don't think is understood by consumers, sellers. So I thought, you know, the government's view is, is that Fenway Park is going to be flooded. So we're here to talk about that. A couple of inaccuracies in this picture, Mandy would never get involved, um, but I thought it was appropriate. But that is the view of what's going to happen. And we have a panel of experts that have helped navigate us through this, this issue. When I was trying to figure out how to put this in perspective, I was reading some quotes. And a member of Congress wrote one that I think is appropriate. And it says, since the law was enacted, we have seen a slew of confusion in FEMA mapping. In addition, many families now face increased costs that make home ownership so expensive they would be forced out of their homes or find it impossible to sell. This is unacceptable. I am committing to fixing unattended consequences. Unattended consequences are you, me, our clients, consumers, their families, and the impact it's going to have onto them. And the person that said this was Maxine Waters, who wrote the act, um, which is, I think, very appropriate. They passed the law, and now, sorry, and now we're going to figure out what the consequence is of this law. So we assembled again, as I said, a panel, a panel of experts that are going to help us um, navigate and understand how this relates to us. How does it relate to when you talk to a potential seller or buyer? What do they need to know? What impact is it going to have on them? And in order to do that, we brought some very uh, extinguished and experienced guests. The first person that I want to introduce is Douglas McDonald. Douglas is president and CEO of Murray McDonald, founded in 1971, or as Douglas wanted me to say a few years ago. Um, he is a certified risk manager, uh, chartered property and casualty underwriter. He's married to Maria, lives in Falmouth, has four children, and is the director of the Cape Cod Sympathy Orchestra. We have Michael Fabiano. Michael is the managing partner and CEO of High Point Engineering. Uh, they're a full service civil, uh, civil engineering and consulting firm. We have Ralph Cataldo. Uh, president of Cataldo Custom Builders, 25 years of building experience. Uh, 2011, Ralph's uh, company was selected by Builder Magazine as the top small builder in America. Pleased to have him. We have Richard Morris uh, of Morris & Newell. Uh, Richard has been in, uh, on Cape Cod uh, practicing since 1970-something. We'll leave it at that. And he's the most avid Red Sox fan that, that I know. Um, at the Bank of Cape Cod, I'd like to introduce some of our folks. Uh, where's Mr. Tom? Tim? Is he here? Tim. Where is everybody? So, President and CEO of the Bank of Cape Cod. Keely Scales uh, is our mortgage underwriter. Proof that mortgage underwriters are people. Uh, Carol Cook. Where's Carol Cook? Carol uh, is one of our mortgage loan officers, and she uh, works out of our Osterville office. And we have Kelly Benway, she works out of the Falmouth office. And Charlie DeSimone, is Charlie still here? Charlie is a senior VP and our commercial lender. 
So we thank you for the opportunity to put this on. We hope it's informative. Uh, before I hand it over to Doug, what we're going to do is we're going to do our presentation, and then I'd ask that you hold your questions until the end. We're going to have a Q&A. We're going to put the panel of experts up, and you can ask any question you want. But I think you will find that the subsequent presentations may answer a lot of what's on your mind. So thank you. Well, kind of makes sense. This is a typical community, uh, Seacoast community in Cape Cod, and uh, it's actually East Falmouth. It's the Manon community. We did a presentation this summer to the neighbors of the Highfield Theatre. But this is very, very typical of Cape Cod. The elevations that everybody's been speaking about range from elevation 4 to elevation 14. So that, over the last 25 years, we've, we've seen just about everything in this community. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get through this as quick as I can here. Yeah. And I just want to show you some of the challenges that us builders and architects face today. And as, as you've heard, this A zone, this V zone construction and all that kind of stuff that uh, you probably already know about, but I'm going to show you some actual examples of what that means from a construction standpoint. This is again the same community. If you can see how exposed that is, and I put a little compass rose on the bottom right hand side. The reason I do that, and you'll see in a minute, but every time we build a home or remodel a home, we always have to consider the flood situation. We have to consider the wind situation. Now, the wind can either make or break your day, whether you're out on the porch or in a boat. But in Cape Cod, you know, everything blows from the southwest direction, and we always, always have to pay attention to the wind. But that whole community right there, there was once a hotel at the end of that main drag, Central Ave, that destroyed one of the early hurricanes. I forget which one, but it was right down there in the water. That's elevation five right there on the seaward side of that street. So that uh, we've done about 25 homes in there, but this is a great example of a uh, Cape Cod neighborhood. That has both uh, flood zone, it has velocity zone, and it's just got regular normal sea zone, as I call it. Okay, this is uh, that was went on to a good day. This is went on to a bad day. I was here at that time. It was Hurricane Bob, 1991, and basically six or eight hours, that 40,000 pound boat just went floating down the river and ended up in somebody's yard. That's how fast Hurricane Bob hit, and the winds at that point were 109 miles an hour. This, for you guys that know the Green Pond Bridge, that's the Green Pond Bridge right there. And there was probably about 50 boats that were stacked up on that bridge. This is another simple flood map, but it, it, I colored it for a reason. Uh, by today's flood map, there's a big difference between that yellow area and the red area. And as Mike was saying earlier, the red area is really all wave action related and wind related. And you really have to understand uh, where that line is. I mean, I assume it's going to change with the new flood maps. But right now, if you have a home or, or, or potential bias homes in that red area, you really got to be careful because it changes so much. The cost of construction is more, uh, the risk is higher, the insurance rates I'm sure are going to be higher. There's a lot of, a lot of issues with, uh, with uh, velocity zone construction. And the utilities, uh, everything is different in velocity zone. Prior to, prior to 2008, it was relatively you know, reasonable and fair to build a home in a velocity zone. But everything has changed since the building code changed in 2008. So you really got to know where those lines are, and it's really easy to, to find out. And I'll explain in a minute. All right, clear guys. Okay. Here we go. Some of the challenges, again, if it's pre existing construction or it's new construction, most of our projects are all new construction or uh, uh, high end remodeling. 90% of them are in the water, so I'm faced with this all the time. Permitting is a little bit more difficult. Uh, structural engineering is a little bit more difficult. Uh, there's very strict code requirements now that every building commission on the Cape is it's pretty consistent now. It's not like the old days. You could just you know make a deal with somebody to get something done. Uh, now it's it, you just you can't. Everything has to be stamped by a structural engineer, and, uh, and it's very very strict. So these are the things that we're, we're faced with every time we go to do a project. I'm going to give you a few examples. This is a flood zone area, elevation 12, meaning when we finish that home, the first floor or the hardwood floor or the, first, or the front door threshold has to be at elevation 12 or above. This was about two feet lower. So I'm just going to show you some quick examples. 
That was a before, and this is the after, about eight to ten months later. This is the same area we went on it. That was designed by Hutko Architects from Fennel. That's the back side of the house. And that's the, the, the after shot of the same house. So that flood elevation is basically six inches lower than that door, the threshold of that door, just to play it safe. This is the view. This is something interesting. If you guys don't know about it, there's a thing called smart vents out there, those little blue things. There's one that's required for every single, if you're in a flood zone, every one of those counts for basically 200 square feet of basement area. So if the basement's 1,000 square feet, you need five of them. And that's what that is. That little white line that runs around the, the foundation, that's actually going to be the cellar floor. What that guy's doing right there is just compacting the fill. Then we'll fill that thing up with, with dirt all the way to that level and pour a four inch slab. And the code says those vents can't be any higher than 12 feet above the ground. Basically, they want the water to come in and they want the water to go out with any, without any pressure on the concrete. And that's what they do. There's very little steel in that foundation. It's not that necessary because, again, it's a flood zone. It's that yellow area, not the red area. So that's, what, that's that same house. That's the foundation of that house. And from that uh, white line to the top is about four feet. So that's what they got for crawl space in that house. Here's the same house, aerial view. We did the house to the right of the pool. And, and don't let anybody tell you that you can't get a pool. It can be done. You just got to have the right engineer and the right architect, and uh, it, can, it can happen. This is uh, the, that yacht club that I showed you earlier. And I just wanted to point out that that normal watermark right there, you see the high tide. Um, that's not always the case. Uh, you know, a couple times a month, that's going to go up about a foot or two, especially when we get a wind of about 40, 50 knots it's going to spill right over into the parking lot. So all these codes are for a reason. They're basically there to protect everybody. They protect the insurance companies, they protect the homeowner, protect the engineers and the architects that design these things. Here's another example of a, a smart vent. I wanted to show you the outside of a foundation right there. It can't be any higher than a foot above that ground like that. And I want you to pay attention to the back corner there where that excavator is. There's a little opening in the foundation. You can have garage doors, you can have elevators, you can have all kinds of things in a flood zone and a velocity zone. In this case, this is another flood zone in West Allen. But that same spot is where it says garage door number three, the right hand corner there. That's the same opening in the foundation. So that's what that house looks like. That's a flood zone. And we actually finished that basin because we have the smart fence. It's all possible. You just gotta, you gotta do your homework. And there it is there in the middle. There's another typical found of, uh, you know, wetlands area. It's got everything in there. Coastal dunes, flood zones, velocity zones. That's most of Cape Cod right there. Oops. Wrong way. All right, I'm going to show you something that's a, it's a really dangerous location. But it's, again, it's permeable. Uh, a lot of these pre-existing coastline lots uh, right on the ocean. This happens to be Vineyard Sound. That house looks directly at Vineyard Haven. It's the end of the Maravista Rav. And some of you guys have probably heard of the term breakaway panels. What that house is, it's sitting on stilts. And there's a big difference between flood zone and velocity zone. This is in a velocity zone. And we made that house look attractive. Let's put some windows in there. And you'll see the breakaway section. I'll show you a couple more slides. But all this stuff is doable. That's a breakaway section right there. At about 200 pounds a square foot, whatever the code is, when the water hits that, that whole panel is just designed to fall in. And you'll see in a second how the water can run inside the house and right out the back. And you could be sitting in the living room up above and, and not worry, technically not worry about anything. But that, that's what it's designed to do. I don't know if I'd do it. I don't know if I'd do it. I've been there in a storm. It's pretty wild. It's only about 50 feet off that river. But uh, there's the house there under construction. And those are, well, some people call them stilts, some people call them pilings. But they're all tied to a footing underneath. And it's loaded with concrete and steel. So you can hit that with a ferry and it, it, it won't go down. So it's pretty, it's pretty substantial. And there it is there before we started the, the blow panels. That's pretty cool. So if that water comes over that riprap wall, through the sound, it's going to go right up the street and up there Mr. Rav. And that's what it looks like. But that's all tied down all the way from the footing, all the way to the roof with straps and bolts and all kinds of 
stuff that they wanted us to install. But that's a good example of a velocity zone home. And the, you've seen hurricane shots. That's how fast it happens. That's the same neighborhood. And uh, there's a couple more. They're all in the same neighborhood. That's Maravis Menard Road in East Town. And uh, that's a house across the street, right there on the stone. It was just a regular stone. That was only about 80 miles an hour. Here's a home that somebody did not want to tear down. It was in the family for about 50 or 80 years or something like that. So we actually had to pick that house up and put a foundation under it, which is, again, always possible. And this is in a velocity zone, so this had to go up higher than most. But I just wanted to show you a couple of slides. This is how, how easy it is to do. Uh, you can just pick it up. <laughs> See the steel I was talking about? A big difference in uh, concrete costs. So that's called cribbing, and those are big I-beams that are set up, and this was done by a building mover. It's actually pretty easy to do. You can, you can put a cup of coffee in the counter and it won't spill if they do it right. A little expensive, but it can definitely be done. And that's just a few more shots of that. That's a foundation being set underneath. We had to get it up high enough so we could work under it, and then we just lowered it on a foundation. You can do block foundation like you see in the middle, and you can do poured concrete. It's, you know, it's the option, and this is us in the middle of the construction. And you can dress it up, you know, really easy once it's all done with shingles and trim and stuff like that. There it is there. Those are gigantic holes in the foundation that uh, allow, again, the water to go across through the in and out. It's the same exact house. That was in 1992. There it is there in the corner of Mr. Rev. This is a house we're doing now, right in the middle of the V. I wanted to show you real quick. I took that shot about two weeks ago. And uh, again, um, typical example, what do you do with this house? Do I keep it? Do I tear it down? There's a lot of cost-benefit analysis that's involved and stuff like this. But if you do your homework with a good builder, a good engineer, you can really give your clients some, uh, some solid educated advice. In this case, we, uh, you can see it was a, an obvious tear down. But uh, the insides were terrible. And this is how you base it. No one's seen this. This is how you tear a house down. It took two days. And uh, it was cleaned up and, and gone. And uh, right now, um, this is a plan you've seen before. But I, I, I put this in here because in the middle, you see the new house footprint. It says FF equals 15. What that means is it's elevation 15 will be the first floor of the hybrid floor. In this case, we have to be at elevation 14. So, uh, you know, we want to be a little bit higher than the minimum. And you've got to be careful because every time you go up a foot, it's another step and a half to the front door. So you've got to be careful. You, you, know, you don't want to have too many steps getting to the front door. In this case, we're going to put an elevator in this house. You're going to drive in the garage, get in the elevator, and go up four floors, three floors. And this is what it's all about, teamwork. You know, it's a Zell Street project. And uh, I know you guys are in a hurry, but I just want to thank everybody for the opportunity today. Okay, we're ready for your questions. Why don't we come on up and... Can the uh, client 
eliminate future flood insurance by simply elevating the house up and above the existing flood zone? Yeah, it, that, that's required, but I mean, you can talk to maybe a mortgage lender right on that, but I'll tell you that if you are above the, uh, the base flood elevation, you have an elevation certificate you know, showing that, um, the answer should be yes, but that's going to be up with your mortgage lender right Yeah, if the, if the property or structure determines not to be in a flood zone, then we would not require the, the insurance. Question for the engineer. In 2009, there was a preliminary uh, theme of maps, aerial uh, remapping that was done. Since then, we now have uh, 2014 uh, maps. In my particular area, the AE zone, the actual elevation of flood elevation, went up four feet in that time. Is that only because of the Act. What changed? None of this. None of their basic information changed. The, uh, the the preliminary maps aren't the current maps. So if it's a preliminary map, even though it may have changed, those aren't what everything's based on yet. Uh, if it's changed, the, um, the the lidar mapping that they use, um, the amount of uh, they've done specific flood studies in the area where they've done transects, they've done profiles. Um, there's all different reasons why the lines have changed. Uh, if, you know, there's some situations where the, uh, the, the map was published, uh, but there's still not a baseball elevation that is, you know, part of that map. Uh, if there's new elevations that are associated, it's because FEMA has done some type of study or some type of um, uh, mapping, you know, based on their LiDAR technology that have uh, distinguished the difference between what the elevations were before and what they're going to be in the future. I need to correct something. Uh, the, the gentleman in the back asked about if they raise the house, you still need to get flight insurance. Um, and I was answering a question as a, I'm giving an answer to a different question. Uh, if you are, if the baseline elevation is 12 feet, and you raise it to 18 feet, so you're quite a bit above the 12, you'll still be required to buy flight insurance, but you just, insurance will be very, very inexpensive. Uh, and that was the answer. I have a two-part question. Um, the first one is, I'm sorry, you keep referring you keep referring to either the property or the building being in the flood zone. So, what is the determination as far as the so what is the determination as far as the insurance? Is it the building or is it the property? And if it is the building, who determines where that is sited on the lot? Because it looks like everything is conforming if you look at a floodplain map. All the properties, all the structures are the same. So, is it the building, the property, and if it's the building? How was that determined where the building was? Yeah, that's a great question. It's always the property. So if uh, you take a look at the flood contour on the map, and even if it's one foot in the flood zone, that entire structure has to be uh, rated. And then at that point, it's the elevation certificate, it's the engineer that will make the determination uh, with the, you know, what is the height of that building's first floor. So it's the, the building itself, not the land. Uh, a, slight, a slight twist to that is in my understanding, I have a couple of affiliates to here. Um, one is Gus Cruzcam from Harbor Engineering and Shane Mallon, who is our, uh, our surveyor for a lot of these projects. Um, you have the opportunity to remove a structure or a lot. If the, if the lot is looking to be removed, then uh, that's when the property line retracing becomes a, a big important piece of the puzzle because you need to know exactly where that property relates. Uh, from a structure standpoint, um, there's not always one structure on a, on a site. So you could have a, a primary residence, you could have a detached garage, you could have a barn, you could have multiple structures and those multiple structures could be sited at different locations and elevation along that, that piece of property. Uh, so if, a, uh, if the barn is in the flood, lower, and the primary residence is above the flood, and you insure the, the primary residence, um, that's not to say that the barn is now insured. So that becomes a problem. And you can tell, one of the issues that comes up all the time with the, 
know, that's important for everyone to understand is that when you look at the LOMAs that are on file, the LOMA will just say structure has been removed. But if there's more than one structure, it doesn't denote which structure has been removed. So it could be that the barn was removed, but the structure that's a primary residence wasn't. So, you know, there's been some insurance companies that have been caught with that because they think the structure that's a primary residence removed, but actually the other structure was. That's why it's confusing on those LOMA applications when it says structure has been removed, been removed from the flood zone. Um, if there's more than one structure, it's, you don't know what structure it is until you actually do the research with the, um, with the background information. And it's been a point of contention recently, some of the discussions that have had with Shane about property. <coughs> Over here. Hi, I'm a relative newbie, so maybe I'm addressing the realtors in the room, but given the cost of hiring an engineer and getting these elevation certificates, who generally is going to be paying for that? Is that going to be the seller, the buyer, or based on each individual case? What, what is the expectation there? <laughs> we, all, we all want to take that question. <laughs> Um, I didn't know. I'm going to give it to the attorney general. Yeah, we'll let him speak to that. I, I thought this was going to be a first where the lawyer didn't get to speak. <laughs> and before I go to that question, I just want to, the most important thing I want to do here today is not move a muscle and make sure this thing doesn't start squeaking and pretty out. We all go to death. <laughs> all right. Um, you know, I think we're going to get to the point where when you take a listing, uh, you want to know what you're selling. And my experience is um, I got an elevation certificate for $600. So $500, $600. I mean, you don't want to take a listing and start spinning your wheels where you can't tell the buyer what you're, uh, what you're selling to them. So I think the seller, the, the broker, the seller's broker is going to have to advise the seller to get an elevation certificate. And I think you're probably going to have to go further than that. I think you're probably going to have to talk to an insurance agent and find out how much the flood insurance is going to cost if it is in a flood zone. So, I mean, because, you know, from a, a buyer's uh, agent perspective, they're, they're not going to go, I don't think, they're not going to go and look at in multiple listing and start showing people uh, property where that fact isn't known because um, there's other properties easier to sell. My opinion. I want to add to that if I can. From a financing perspective, we're eventually going to find out what the cost is to insure that property if it ends up being in the flood zone. What we don't want is 48 hours before closing, because somebody went to Doug and got the what it costs for flood insurance to determine that the borrower no longer qualifies. You know, there's a host of issues that come up with that. One of them being they're going to probably get denied for the mortgage. So the sooner you know, the sooner the buyer knows the cost to buy that house, the better for everybody. Because you don't want to derail it 60 days down the line. So I think Richard gives great advice. A couple of questions, Ben. I wanted to just add on to that. I uh, was contacted back in August by someone who's buying a property closing uh, Wednesday. Uh, it took us a long time, to, and it had a LOMA involved, and it took a bunch of hoops to go through, but when we submitted it, it took uh, 10 days before we actually got a policy. And so if they're thinking at closing, I'll just call up and get a flood policy, that's not the time to do it. You really need to do your homework in advance. 